All right, let's start again. Good morning. To get back on track, uh, make some noise if you're happy to worship Jesus. That was pretty good. You guys aren't normally that talkative. All right. Uh, so I, I, I got to confess, uh, before we dive into the Bible, I, I, I do have to confess, I'm out of my element. I am so far out of my element up here. And I am out of my element in life in general. Where I am at now, at 25, about to be 26, is so far different than what I was planning on being. Yes, Haley, that's your fault. What I mean is that I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not at home up here. You know, uh, this isn't where I thought I was going to be. I am at home. I am comfortable on a baseball field or on a basketball court, on a football field. I'm comfortable competing with a team of guys who are wearing the same uniform as me. That is where I am most at peace, is competing in a sport, trying to get the win. I'm comfortable barking orders and yelling at my teammates when they screw up and let a ground ball go right between their legs. I'm really good at yelling at people. I really am. You can ask my children. But nowadays, my team, my teammates, they're not even competing for first place anymore. My teammates aren't even wearing the same uniform. I'm dressed in blue. I like blue, black, red. My teammates are all wearing pink and sparkles and glitter. <laughs> I'm out of my element. And it's certainly out of my plans. My plan, I was going to be the next starting shortstop from the New York Yankees. I was going to be the guy who took over for Derek Jeter. And that's where I was going. God's plan, it seems to be decorated in sparkles and glitter. See, God's plan, it seems to involve me using my voice and not my body. God's plan, it, uh, it involves me learning sympathy, empath sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Three things that I'm not very good at. He's giving me a crash course in all three things using three little girls. Because three little girls need all three of those things. See, God knows his sheep need the hammer, like Moses. They need the hammer of Moses to keep them honest. But God also knows his sheep. They need that gentle and kind, soft-spoken, compassionate lamb of God. Because he knows, he knows it takes both of those things in order for mankind to get it even remotely right. We need the hammer, but we also need the Lamb of God to put us at ease when we're not at ease. And he knows which of the two I need to work at being. So my plans used to be mine, but now my plans have to be God's if I want to become even a shadow of what God wants me to be. And today we're going to cover giving up our own plans and our own ways for the sake of living up to the potential that God has set for each one of us personally. So please turn with me to Mark 8.35. We're going to read two, uh, two scriptures and then dive into a story in the Old Testament. So let's start with Mark 8.35, please. Holla when y'all get there. There's not enough people. All right, so Mark 8, 35. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Got a feeling where we're going with this? So flip over to 2 Corinthians five seventeen. Make some noise again if you love Jesus. That was so weak. Second Corinthians 5.17. That's what I said, right? Yeah. 
This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Getting a little more clear, huh? That uh, we're supposed to be letting go of our own plans. We're supposed to be issuing a new set of rules and a new set of ideas when we become a little more like Jesus. So with that in mind, with these two verses on our hearts, I want to cover a story today of a man in the Old Testament who exemplified these two verses very well. His name is Gideon. So please turn now again to Judges 6, verses 12 through 16. And this is where we're going to camp out for the rest of the day. Maybe. So while y'all are turning, I'll go ahead and give a backstory to Gideon and what's going on right now. See, what's happening in this story where we're about to pick up is God's people, the Israelites, as usual, they have disobeyed God and done wrong. And as usual, God had to bring in the hammer because he's got to keep his people honest. So God, what God does is he brings in another nation called the Midianites and allows the Midianites to rule over the Israelites. They were very cruel people. They were... <laughs> They were not nice, to say the least. They, 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 they would mostly come in during the harvest time of the year and destroy all the food and crops and even the animals of the Israelites, leaving them to starve and fend for themselves one way or another. And so in this story, we see a man doing what he can to fend for not just himself but his family. Gideon, so Gideon is threshing wheat. Well, we're jumping in. He's threshing wheat, which is a process that they did to collect grain, which is what they used to eat, obviously. Hmm. And he had to do this in hiding. He didn't do this out in the open where it's supposed to be done. It's supposed to be done. They throw the grain up. The wind blows away all the bad stuff, and all the grain that's edible falls to the ground. But he has to do it in hiding where there's probably not much wind at all. So this is where we're at in the story. Gideon is threshing wheat. And if you guys are there, holler. Sorry? Oh, uh, 6, 12 through 16. Okay. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. There is uh, so much to glean from this little section of Scripture. Uh, so for seven years, Gideon and his people, they're cowering in fear. Hiding is what they're good at. Being afraid is what they're good at. And Gideon, if you look back at verse 15, he said, I am the least in my family. So not only are the Israelites good at hiding, and so is Gideon, but Gideon's also good at believing what his own people say about him. No one is born thinking everyone else is better. Someone installed that into Gideon. So he's afraid of his enemy and convinced that he's worthless. But look back at verse 12. We know Gideon thinks he's worthless, but in verse 12, what does God say? God says, mighty hero or valiant warrior, depending on the translation. Does Gideon seem like a mighty hero to you guys, hiding in fear? No, he doesn't. Not at all. Neither do we sometimes. But God doesn't see the way we do. We see the obvious obstacles, but God sees potential warriors. While we're busy focusing on all of our enemies and our fears and our worries, God's focused on shaping us and molding us into heroes. And all it takes to find out what that's like to become that hero, it really is simple. It's to follow Jesus, and he will help you let go of all the fear and the lies that we've let others convince us of. He will 
shape us into heroes. Verse 16, I will be with you. That is a promise from the Lord. God doesn't break his promises. And take it from personal experience, having God on your side, that's the greatest thing I've ever known. Forgive me if I get a little emotional over this next few parts, but something about talking about how God loves and what he's done for me really just breaks me down and just, it melts me on the inside. So knowing God, again, has been the greatest thing I've ever known from giving me the strength to stop cowering behind alcohol and cigarettes to strength to shed the false beliefs about myself that I've let family and friends instill into me to the amazing gifts like, you know, financial blessings and far more importantly, my daughters and my wife. And ever since I took that first step out of hiding and onto the Lord's path, it's been like fighting one man just as God promised. And it used to be tiring. It used to be overwhelming, and I I know what most of y'all are thinking because I've heard it a million times from anyone 20 years older than me. You're too young to be tired. I know, I know, I know. I'm too young. What's Gideon? Gideon's the youngest guy in his tribe. He's the youngest guy in his family. But what's verse 13 tell us? Gideon's tired. What do you guys do when you're tired of life beating you down? When one thing after another comes at you, what are you doing? You're asking God the same questions that Gideon is doing right now in verse 13. Where have you been? What are you doing? Why me? Why now? Why won't you? I thought you. We're all doing it all the time. I'm young, so is Gideon. So maybe we're not as tired as you, but all your age means to me is that you've had more questions for God than I have. Doesn't mean I'm not any less tired. And neither is Gideon. See, I know what tired is. We all know what tired is. Tired. Hmm. Tired is floating out on the Gulf of Mexico, going scalloping for the first time in your life, enjoying things, first vacation with your wife, and getting a phone call that one of your <laughs> that one of your best friends is going to die unless God moves. That's tired. Tired is remembering at seven years old (laughs) that if God does not move, your mother never will again. Tired? Tired is having your first child and her first breath possibly being her last. That's not my baby. That's my best friend's. Tired is finally getting a daughter and them telling you that you need to come tell her goodbye. That's tired. Tired is being told that your mother probably won't live to 40. Tired is being told you probably won't live to 40. Tired is fighting cancer. Tired is having a stroke at... uh, I think he was six years old, six to nine years old, having a stroke, and at 19, still dealing with the effects. That's tired. Tired is raising 10 kids. Tired is me being the ninth of those 10 kids. (laughs) Tired is raising a teenage daughter from 1,400 miles away. We know what tired is. Every one of us knows what tired is. But what's tired compared to King Jesus? Yeah, y'all don't hear, yeah, uh-uh, y'all didn't hear me. What's tired compared to the Prince of Peace? What is tired compared to the God who is the source of our strength? We know what tired is, but it doesn't matter because we have God. The enemy surrounds us, but Jesus Christ stands in between us and the enemy. It doesn't matter what tired is. So this is a Michael W. Smith song. I wrote Matthew West, but I found out today it's Michael W. Smith. He sings. I lost the words. I'm so sorry. (laughs) It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. 
We might be surrounded by the enemy, but Jesus stands in between us. Is he tired? We know what tired is. And one more little tired story. Tired is finally getting a son. My wife right now is pregnant with a son. Three daughters, and I got a son on the way, finally. But tired is uh, her having to get blood work done, and the blood work coming back and telling us that there's something inside of her that might potentially kill the baby. Tired is getting that phone call and sitting out in front of the church on a Tuesday night before Bible study and not having the strength to go in. (laughs) And so I'm sitting in my car before Bible study with tears streaming down my face. And the music's blaring, and I'm singing my heart out. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And I was about five minutes late that particular night. Not that I'm ever the guy to show up late. In fact, I'm always, I'm always, yeah, I'll still be Jerome, but <laughs> you can always count on Rome being late. I'm five minutes late because I got here five, 15 minutes early, but I sat in my car singing this song over and over and over and over again because I was tired. And then God showed up, (laughs) as he does. Every time we cry out to our Heavenly Father, I promise he shows up. I promise because he promised. So he shows up. He fills me with strength. I wipe away the tears. I go into Bible study. We have a great night of study. And then I share with the guys what's going on. And so now, five idiots and a preacher are praying to God that this potential threat to my little boy would come back as a non-threat, because it could have been one or the other. It was a 50-50. It could have been non-threatening, or it could have been threatening. And less than a week later, we get the news. We didn't even even find out if it was a threat or not, because God just wiped it all out. It came back gone because that's who God is. And I love God so much. Again, if you love Jesus, make noise. If you want to know what it's like to experience that kind of peace and strength and reassurance and continuous blessings, there's one simple step you have to do. Bowing a knee to Jesus and getting baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God will mold you into the mighty hero that he wants you to be. 2 Corinthians 5.17 said the old is out and the new is in. So diving back into Judges with that verse in mind, what was Gideon doing when God called him out? He was threshing wheat to feed his family. And if the Midianites catch Gideon doing this, well, they're not going to reward him, to put it nicely. Keep it PG. The lowliest member of the lowliest family in all of Israel right now is taking a huge risk providing for his family. And can we agree that while Gideon's old way of doing things, it's not glamorous, it certainly looks heroic, if you ask me. Because he's taking a massive gamble trying to feed the very people who told him he's insignificant. That's heroic. Now, while Gideon's old way, it's not a bad way, and it's not an evil way. It's just not God's way. It's his. And his way is showered in fear. It's done in the dark, and it's small-scale production. But God's way, it's flooded with courage. It's a city on a hill shining bright for everyone still hiding in the dark to look upon. It is nation-saving-sized production. That is what God's way is, and it's God's way or no way your way isn't lined up with God's way, I'm sorry, but you're not doing it right, whether you think it's good or not. It might look good, but if it's not God, it's not right. Gideon could have said no to God. We read these stories, and we kind of think, all oh, these Old Testament dudes, you know, they're just great, outstanding characters. And they just did what they were told because they're robots, and they didn't have a choice, but they did have a choice. Gideon could have said no. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is what's been working. 
It wasn't been working. It was feeding my family, hiding from the Midianites, threshing wheat in the dark because it sort of feeds people, kind of. We got to share the less grain, but it works, sort of. But he didn't do that. He let go of his way, and he chose God's way. And he shows us what happens when you take God's way. You defeat the surrounding enemy as if it's one man. That's later in the story. We haven't read it yet. But I assure you, he defeats the enemy like it's one man. It's, it's quite a story. Now, had Gideon stuck to his own heroics, who knows how long the Midianites would have continued crushing his people. Mark 8.35 tells us, had he tried to hang on to his way of doing things, he surely would have lost his life. Instead, he gave up his own way for God's way, and he's no longer the insignificant little brother. He is the mighty hero who saved the day. His old life is gone, his new life has become, and he has become a far cry from the least in his family. And that's something that we all can do. No matter where we're at in our lives, we can do that. Go back to look at verse 14 of Judges 6. God said, go with the strength you have. Does it look like Gideon has a lot of strength? No. What strength? The littlest, youngest, most insignificant brother in the family strength? No. Is it the risk your life so you can feed the very people who make you feel like crap strength? That's the kind of strength God is calling him out with. God didn't call him and promise him a supernaturally divine created strength. He's not Samson, and neither are we. We don't get to grow our hair and be stronger than Hercules. It, doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, especially you, guy. <laughs> you still got, uh, well, I guess Moses has you beat. He called Gideon to step up with the very human strength he had and the promise that God will make a way. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. You don't have to turn there, but I am going to. All right. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. It says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. God will, he wants us to step up with the strength we have, because he's got an even stronger strength ready to give you, to help you and lead you and show you, and quite frankly, win the battle for you in the heat of the moment. He doesn't need you to use your own might. He wants you to lean on him. The yoke of Christ will get you through any and every possible thing you've ever dealt with or are dealing with. So what's getting left in the past? Or as Corinthians 5.17, what old is dying? It's not the thing that set Gideon apart from his people. You know, that courage that let him go out and thresh wheat knowing the consequences if he's caught. That's not what's getting left in the past. No, it's the fear. It's the insecurities and the belief in the lies. It's the doubts and the questions that he had for God. So he threw off the old and he embraced the new because God said, I will be with you. He abandoned his way of life and surrendered to God's way of life. Or in New Testament terms, he died to the flesh and was born into the spirit. You might not feel like the Gideon in your story. Maybe you want to be more like one of the other, one of the other Israelites. Throw Gideon to the wolf, let him figure it out, and I'm going to sit back and just watch it happen. But it doesn't matter. It does not matter if you feel like Gideon or not, because every one of us has been called by the same God. We're all fighting the same enemy with the same fear. But again, it's the same God who promised Gideon he will be with him as he promises us he will be with us. He is providing the same deliverance for any and everybody who will bow a knee to Jesus, choosing his way, calling him Lord, and jumping in the baptismal waters, dying to the old and coming out in the new. So later in this story, 
Gideon puts the call out to his Israelites, we're going to go to war. We're going to overcome the Midianites because God said so. So God, I'm sorry, Gideon puts out the call and 32,000 strong warrior Israelis come together under Gideon's rule and God says, you got too many men. If I let this many men fight, y'all going to get cocky, think you did it, and give me no credit. So God tells Gideon, instruct anyone who's afraid to go home. So 22,000 men leave. Now we're down to 10,000. God, said, God says, it's still too many. Mind you, they're fighting a nation. So Gideon is instructed by God to keep any man who laps up water from the lake or the sea like a dog, which is a strange instruction, but whatever. God gets to choose. He's God. You're not. So Gideon and 300 men are all that's left to save Israel. And if you think for one second that God is going to give you a worldly reason to be courageous, you're wrong. He's going to stack the deck against you. Blame him or the devil, it doesn't matter. God's using everything for your good as long as you bow a knee. You can credit the devil for what's going on in your life, or you can just glorify God and accept, hey, this is what's going to happen, and God's got me. So I'm going to go against the enemy with me and God, and I don't need anything else because I got the promise of God, and that's all we need. He doesn't want you leaning on your own strength. He wants you to lean into him. Humble yourself. And by that, I mean admit you can't handle the problem. You can't do it and that you need God to do it and he will make a way. Trash that old God won't give me more than I can handle. It's not what it says. He will give you a lot more than you can handle. Do you think Gideon and 300 men can fight an entire nation by themselves? That's more than they can handle. God wants you to feel like you need him because he wants you to need him. He wants you to want him. Moses could have saved the Israelites. I'm sorry. Hmm. He couldn't have saved the Israelites. If he didn't need God, he could have. If Moses didn't need God, he could have saved the Israelites from the Egyptians on his own. Right? Right? Gideon could have defeated the Midianites on his own if God, you know, was okay with us being self-sufficient. The 12 disciples, they didn't need God and they could do it on their own. They could have reached the ends of the earth with their own message about fishing and taxing and whatever else they did. They could have reached the ends of the earth with their own good news. but that's not possible, is it? You think 12 men could have reached the ends of the earth with a story of fishing all on their own? No. Moses, he wasn't going to be able to lead 3 million Israelites out of Egypt. The dude had a speech impediment or some sort. He's supposed to stand in front of Pharaoh and say, let my people go. He can't even speak the words. But God, Moses' favorite phrase ever, but God made a way. But God promised, I will be with you. You will fight one man, no matter how many stand in front of you. I am in between. It will be like fighting one man. Because God is an amazing God. We all have our own way of doing things. We all have our own crutches, no matter what it is, anything. We all have our own crutch. Cigarettes, alcohol, maybe something more severe, maybe something less severe. If your crutch isn't Jesus, it's the wrong crutch. Your way will not get it done. God's way will. I'm up here speaking not because I'm comfortable. I'm not comfortable. I am not in my element. I don't have a baseball glove on. Nobody's throwing an 80 mile an hour fastball at my face. I'm not comfortable here. But it doesn't matter. 
Because just as God promised Moses, I will be with you when you stand before Pharaoh, God promised me, I will be with you as you stand before my people and give them the gentle, kind, compassionate Lamb of God. Dedicate yourself to God's way and he will show up in a manner you've never known before. We all fight the enemy every day of our life. It's nothing new. The Bible tells us nothing new under the sun will come. It is all the same stuff repeating for everyone. But just as it's the same enemy, it's the same God. And just as the devil was no match for God then, he is no match for God now. He will not forsake you or abandon you. He died for you, pleading that we be forgiven. Jesus chose us because he wants you to stand up and fight with him. He will make the way, because he is the way, as Moses taught us last week. Hmm. Jesus is wonderful. God is wonderful. God, Heavenly Father, he's wonderful, but I'm out of stuff on my paper. I don't want to just start rambling and disrespect God in any way. So, I'm going to pray. And then Moses, I believe, possibly is going to come up. Gun hammer lights, please. I guess set the mood for you guys. Please bow your heads. Get alone with God. Speak to Him in your heart. Father God, I am. Um, I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable speaking on your behalf, Lord. There are far more many men that are far more equipped to teach and preach something as holy as you. But you told me to get up here and talk. So I'm up here talking, Lord, and I got to say what an honor it is that you chose me, Father God, and I don't think it's anything I've done. I think it's everything that you have planned. If it's based off of my merit, I wouldn't be here, Lord. I wouldn't have the strength to stand in front of probably 50 or 60 people. I wouldn't have the strength to stand in front of five or six people. I wouldn't have the courage and I wouldn't be comfortable enough to do it, Lord. But because you said it must be done, it must be done, Lord. And I acknowledge, I acknowledge that, Father God. Forgive me if I don't, if I don't do it the way that you wanted it to be done, Lord. If I messed up any way, Lord, I pray that you would fix that screw up, that you would let it speak to anybody's heart that you would teach them in their spirits and their minds and their hearts, Lord, that you are the strength. You are the strength, Father God. You provide it. Without you, we are nothing but dust. From dust we came to dust we shall go, but with Jesus in heaven, we will rise. Because that's what you said will happen. And if you make a promise, Lord, I know in my spirit and heart that you will keep that promise. You promise that you would be with us. You promise you would lead us. You promised every single person in this room personally that you will help them fight the enemy as if they're standing against one man, no matter how big the odds seem. No matter the boulder in front of them or the mountain they think they got to climb, it doesn't matter because with faith the size of a mustard seed, we can throw that mountain in the sea. Amen. You, Lord, are the reason we gather. You, Lord, are the reason some poor schmuck like me <laughs> can stand up and preach your word. And I pray everyone who has never received the good news of the gospel would receive it in their heart, Father God that they would bow a knee and say yes. They would make you Lord. And I pray everyone who has done that in the past, but has straight away would shed the old way of doing it and embrace your way. 
because your way is the righteous, mighty way. And without your way, we are destined for darkness, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to get up here, Father God. It really is an honor. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. Um, while we're praying, um, I'd ask you to just bow your head again. Someone brought a, a prayer request to me, and I want to pray uh, for this thing with you. vaguely know this young man. It's been years since I've seen him or spoken to him. But um, there's a young man named Brandon Oliver who is um, just half brother uh, to my daughter Chelsea. And um, I guess he's in his 20s, served in the military, has PTSD, and uh, he's missing. Nobody knows where he is. He's been gone for, I guess, a couple of weeks. His apartment is left as is, hasn't spoken to anyone, and off his medication. Really don't know really where he lives, what state he's in or anything like that, but... There's a God whose eyes go back and forth across the earth. Lord, we know that you see Brandon now. And we pray, Lord, for the supernatural. We pray that somehow, some way, in ways that we can't comprehend, that you would speak to his very soul and let him know he's a mighty hero. Let him know that there's something inside of him that is precious and mighty and good, just like you saw in Gideon. And Lord, I pray that you would help him to be found. You're the amazing shepherd that goes after lost sheep. So we would ask that you would go after him and let him be found. We pray for his family. who is no doubt frightened. Lord, I don't even know what it would feel like to have to deal with that. So we just ask for your spirit to comfort his family and bring him back home safely. Lord, as we now uh, turn our attention toward your kingdom away from ourselves for a moment